mit Phosphor und Uran. Welcome to Kino. We'll have more breakdancing and three remarkable down-to-earth siblings coming up in the show. But first, what happens when people lose their grounding and get overwhelmed by life's chaos? That's what Gravity, the highly successful debut by director Maximilian Erlenwein, is about. Erlenwein studied here at the Film Academy in Berlin, where the current crop of students is no doubt wondering what the secret is to making such a splash as a first-time director. To find out, we took a closer look at Gravity. Muss ich nicht die Tür nehmen? Fünf? Vier? Äh, drei? Schnell, ja, was kommt denn jetzt? Eine Mundlandung oder? Zwei? Eins? Wiedersehen. And just like that, a very ordinary day in the life of this bank clerk takes a serious turn for the worse. Frederick Feinemann's an ordinary guy with a good, solid job. But after this experience, he gets no understanding from the boss. Maximilian Erlenwein's first feature-length film looks set to be a roaring success. He's reaping the rewards of an industrious student career where he won a number of awards, made good contacts in the industry, and got to work writing. I started off with a completely different story, but after a whole year of writing, I canned it. And all that was left was this crime story. At film school, I gained experience in making TV shows and made some short films. So I got funding fairly easily. A successful first film can be an important springboard, especially when it comes to financing further projects. Frederick runs into an old school friend who asks about getting a bank loan. Da gibt's so eine Fragekatalog. Das heißt, äh, wie ist deine berufliche Situation? Hast du Sicherheiten? Ich glaube, ich war die letzten Jahre im Knast. Ich habe keine Sicherheiten oder sowas. Du warst im Knast? Another key to movie success is choosing the right cast. And in this lineup, Fabian Hinrichs and Jürgen Vogel complement each other beautifully. Also kriege ich jetzt einen Kredit oder nicht? Nein, von der Bank hast du keinen. I made a short film with Fabian Hinrichs called Blackout, and then we were roommates for a while, and I knew I'd make my next film with him in the main role. It was such a luxury, writing the script and knowing who my lead was and how the dialogue might sound. Jürgen Vogel was perfect for the role of Vince, but I never dreamt he'd actually go for it. Ich hätte es aber echt im Traum nicht dran gedacht, dass das auch wirklich klappt. Ich weiß einfach alles über meine Kunden. Was sie verdienen, ob sie Alimente zahlen, wann sie wie viele abgehoben haben und vor allem, wann die nicht zu Hause sind. Und weißt du, warum ich das weiß? Weil die mir das erzählen. Frederick hm? makes a career move from loan officer to burglar. Ich mach sozusagen eine Ausbildung bei dir. Siehst du die Scans? Ja. Die Ausbildung beginnt. Du schnappst dir den größten von den Typen und machst ihn platt. Und Regel Nummer eins, nie lange fackeln. The film takes a surprising but compelling turn. With just the right degree of action and intrigue, Maximilian Allenwein depicts a bank employee gone wild. Du bist nicht mehr ganz dicht. What the FIFA? Sag mal, der Typ, der hier wohnt, was macht denn der so beruflich? Der hat eine Sicherheitsfirma. Was? Kriminalpolizei. Bei Ihnen ist eingebrochen worden. Ich will Ihren Ausweis sehen. Entschuldigung, Sie behindern gerade die Staatsgewalt. Mhm. Ich wollte eine, äh I wanted to create a fantasy world of heightened reality. That's what the story is about, really. It's the opposite of the Berlin school approach, documenting what's really going on. So it's not a social study in that sense. It's all exaggerated, make-believe. That was important from the very beginning, and it's what I enjoy in other films. Wichtig ist halt so wie was mir auch selber Spaß macht an anderen Filmen. 
Some of the industry's big players caught wind of the film and headed to the Berlin premiere to see it for themselves. And it seems Maximilian Allenwein's film lived up to the hype. I was captivated. It's a really great script, excellent dialogue, and the story develops expertly, and the acting is wonderful. He's a promising director. I would never have known that it was his first film. He's a natural. It was a lot of fun. Alan Vine is already working on his next project and hoping that the success of his first film will pay off. A director's second film is known for being the hardest, but at least funding should be taken care of with money from awards. It had always been my dream to make a feature-length film. It's a weird feeling that I've finally done it, and to suddenly have the opportunity to pursue this professionally and make more. It'd be fantastic if it works out. Forging a career in cinema is anything but easy, but Alan Vine's got youth, talent and ambition on his side. So watch this space. Fabian Hinrichs is one of the best actor nominees for the German Film Awards, which will be presented on April 23rd. Also up for the best actor Lola is David Striso for his role in the film So Glücklich War Ich Noch Nie or I've Never Been So Happy. We're giving away a DVD of the movie and here's a clip with David Striso as an obsessive social climber. Ich bin die Fritzi. Und wie heißt du? Mein Name ist Prinz. Klaus Hensley. Herr Dr. Rotenstein. Müller. Dr. von Stein. Von Weizsäcker. Among the nominees for Best Actress Lola is Corinna Harfuch for her lead role in the relationship drama This is Love. Als ich in die Wohnung kam, war niemand zu Hause. Das ist jetzt 16 Jahre her. Ich habe meinen Mann seitdem nie wieder gesehen. We're giving away both DVDs for a chance to win. Drop us a line to tell us what you think of Kino. Here's our email address, kino at dw-world.de. This is a cutting room, a place most moviegoers never get to see. But the editing that goes on here is a vital part of filmmaking. It's how the various elements of images, sound and music come together to create the finished product. Our reporter Oliver Glasenab met editor Uta Schmidt to find out just how important the process is. I meet Uta Schmidt en route to her second home, the cutting room. Right now she's working on the latest feature film by German director Chris Kraus, Pole, which is set in Estonia on the eve of the First World War. In post-production, actress Janetta Hein had to be edited out of one scene, not because she acted badly or forgot her lines, but in the interest of dramaturgy. She said in this scene, in this scene, she has a line that takes the plot off in a different direction. So we cut her out, so as to shift the focus back to the two characters who are integral to the scene. Um die Konzentration einfach auf die beiden, um die es eigentlich geht, zu lenken. In the first edit, Janetta Hein appears at the very beginning of the scene. She walks around the car over to Edgar Selger. In the re-edit, the scene's cut before she comes into view. So initially the audience is only party to the two men. The one guy insults the other, and she arrives on the scene just in time to comfort him. It has much more impact than when she was involved at the beginning. Is there a golden rule an editor should always go by, or are all films ultimately different? 
Ich versuche natürlich immer möglichst. I always try my best to retain the viewer's interest. Und, um, was aber Which is not to say that each scene has to be intense or gripping. You keep the audience involved by allowing the plot to lull at times so that the scene you're building up to achieves its optimal impact. And it's this that lends a film its rhythm. One film known for its rhythm is Chris Krause's most recent work, Four Minutes, which won 46 awards, one of which went to Uta, the German camera prize for best editing. Four Minutes brings together two strong women from distinctly separate worlds, the elderly piano teacher Trauder and the piano prodigy and convict Jenny. In order to take part in a prestigious contest, Jenny has to escape from prison. The final four minutes of the film are what lend it its title. The music was so forceful, as were the performances, so the editing was just a matter of fine-tuning. In this case, I had such an enormous amount of material to work with for the last scene that it was by no means the hardest to cut. So how many camera angles were there in the scene? There were 42 shots, and then all the individual takes. The film ratio was 77 to 1. So for every minute of film, there were 77 minutes of material. This is how Uta learned the ropes of her profession, on a good old-fashioned editing table, where cutting means, quite literally, cutting and pasting the film frame by frame. When you were watching the film, you could tell whenever there'd been a splice, where frames were stuck together. It jolted, giving the film a certain rhythm. You had to take that into account and plan really carefully. So how does it work here, digitally? The difference is astounding. Now we have multiple audio tracks and separate image tracks. These black lines mark out the individual edits, both in sound and image. Then there are separate tracks for ambient sound and separate tracks for sound effects. Before, we just had a narrow strip for sound bites and a second audio track to record the music, and that was it. As soon as the shoot is underway, Uta gets to work editing the individual scenes. But tucked away in her editing suite, she's far removed from the lights, camera and action. Do you ever develop a kind of relationship with the actors? No, not with the actors, but with the characters they're playing. You do run the risk of projecting stuff onto them. You go bounding up to an actor as if you were their best friend, and they turn to you and say, sorry, do I know you? But it's nice when the actors are happy with your work. It makes me really proud when I get compliments from the cast. It's an ambitious task, whittling many hours of material down to just a few. But for Uta, the end product is always worth it. Sadly, we have to wait a little longer than Uta for the final cut. Pole hits the big screen in 2011. In our shortcuts, we look at two films that could not be more different. One is an action-packed drama and the other a pensive pilgrimage to a miraculous place. Lourdes in the south of France is one of Europe's most popular pilgrimage destinations. Thousands flock here every year in the hope they'll be cured of illness, disability or sin. Austrian director Jessica Hausner's film reserves judgment as it depicts their hopes and faith. Christina is crippled by multiple sclerosis, 
and skeptical of religion. But she's on the lookout for a bit of excitement in her life and travels to Lourdes in search of it. She plays along with the pilgrims, doing everything that's expected of a good Christian. All as though it were utterly normal. Sylvie Testud plays the cynical yet quietly observant Christina, who's in for a big surprise. Ich möchte einfach gesund sein, ein normales Leben führen. Was ist das? Ein normales Leben? Beten wir gemeinsam. Herr, wir bitten dich, heile diese junge Frau. Christina remains skeptical, right up until she finds she can walk again. An unfathomable fact for both Christina and her fellow pilgrims. Entschuldigen Sie die Störung. Ich hätte eine Frage. Wir alle, wir fragen uns, warum ist jetzt gerade sie geheilt worden und nicht, sagen wir, der Rogi? For all the gravity of its subject matter, Lourdes retains a light playfulness and keen sense of irony, moving seamlessly between moments of transcendence and outright farce. It's a quiet portrait of faith and the unfaithful, united in hope. Walls, concrete canyons, construction sites. For Ritchie, the settings for his gravity-defying feats of physical magic. The parkour phenomenon sets the stage for an action-packed feature film debut. Ritchie works in construction, but his two passions in life are parkour and his girlfriend, Hannah. He's also insanely jealous and on the verge of losing control. Ach, und im Übrigen, wenn wir schon mal dabei sind, ja, stimmt, ich hatte schon mal andere Typen. Das ist leider nicht der Erste. Eventually, money problems, fraud and jealousy combine, threatening to ruin his life. But the more the young man tries to maintain control, the more he slips into madness. It all reaches a tragic climax as Richie can't, or won't, save a colleague from a deadly construction accident. Director Mark Renzing deftly weaves the hip sport of parkour through the film, using it as a framework to portray a young man's search for inner balance. Körper und Geist. Sind einer ein. Renzing's debut is a finely rendered psychodrama about a disturbed young man driven by fear of the future and a need to manipulate those most dear to him. This week saw the passing of Werner Schröter, one of post-war Germany's most important filmmakers. Schröter was a director with many passions, working in opera and theater as well as in film and his productions were always thrillingly unique. We pay tribute to Werner Schröter, a major artist in German cinema. He was a radical outsider, a loner in the world of German cinema. Werner Schröter, seen here on the red carpet in Venice in 2008, visibly weakened by cancer. I can't understand people who fear death. It's something we all have to face at a time of its choosing. Schröter's films were independent and uncompromising, far removed from mainstream cinema. His most successful feature, a portrayal of a young Sicilian who comes to Germany as a guest worker. <laughs> It was awarded a Golden Bear at the 1980 Berlin Film Festival. But Schröter's first love was opera and the larger-than-life emotions ranging from ecstasy to the yearning for death. In this moving film, he immortalizes song as the highest form of human expression. 
This, these films and these songs are love's debris. Some critics accused him of affectation and too much pathos, but Schröter also contributed moments of perfect sensibility along with opulent images. One of his greatest works was a film version of Ingeborg Bachmann's novel Malina, with Isabel Huppert as an author destroyed by love. It garnered Schröter the German Film Prize in 1991. Schröter won acclaim as an independent director and gained widespread admiration, especially in France and Italy. He debuted his last major motion picture at the 2008 Venice Film Festival. Tonight is an apocalyptic drama, done in a theatrical style with larger-than-life tableaus. It portrays the final destruction of a civilization. The Venice Film Festival honored him with a golden lion for his life's work. Now, Schröter is gone, leaving behind the lasting legacy of a great filmmaker. This is the Berlin district of Neukölln, home to some 300,000 people. Nearly 40% of the residents have an immigrant background, such as the Akush siblings who have lived here for 16 years, yet live each day under the threat of deportation. Two documentary filmmakers accompanied them for several years. The result is a surprisingly optimistic and entertaining film, Neukölln Unlimited. At age 19, Liel has fulfilled her biggest dream. She's a singer in a pop band. Her brother Hassan is a rapper, appearing throughout Europe with his street dance crew. 14-year-old Maradona is a talented breakdancer. The Akush family hails from the blue-collar Berlin district of Neukölln. They immigrated here 18 years ago from Lebanon. The three siblings grew up in Neukölln, and the youngest, Maradona, was born in Berlin. There's no question as to where they feel most at home. There are parts of Berlin that are just boring. Some districts are so one-dimensional. But Neukölln has everything to offer. There's something special about Neukölln. When I'm out and about, it seems sometimes like a village. Everyone knows each other. What I like most about Neukölln is the street life. Neukölln Unlimited centers on the Akush siblings' special identity with their adopted home. The documentary portrays the life of the three talented entertainers, their friends, nightlife, and some very real problems. The family has never received official residency status. The threat of deportation is a daily reality. The Akush family has taken its case to a special commission that decides whether extenuating circumstances will allow them to stay. How do young people channel their anger when a nameless bureaucracy demands such a decision, when teenagers are forced to decide whether or not the family should be torn apart, when on any given morning they might be deported? Liel, Maradona and Hassan dance. Street dance has become much more than just a vent for their frustrations. At first they performed for a pittance, giving every euro they earned to their mother. The Akush family was eager to prove that they could fend for themselves. But it wasn't enough for the government agencies responsible for foreigners. The documentary has given the three a measure of fame. Media interest is high and they're constantly doing interviews. They have director Agostino Imondi to thank for thrusting them into the limelight. He shot 160 hours of film and in that time became a close friend. 
It really came to me in a personal way that we had met three young people who were trying their hardest to build a life here, to establish roots, and that one door after another was being slammed in their faces. We feel as if we've already been deported, so we're just looking for justice on our own terms. We want the bureaucrats to say that this family makes a contribution. We're not just freeloaders. And that work ethic shows when they take to the dance floor. Neukölln Unlimited is a harsh and uncompromising look at the realities behind the continuing debate over immigration and integration in Germany, putting a human face on a very real problem. That's all from Kino for this month. We'll be back in May with all the latest news in German cinema. Until then, we'll see you at the movies.